Well, thank you all for joining us to the next um, session in, in the conference. So we had a, a break and I hope all of you are refreshed. And it's a great pleasure for me to um, introduce my team colleagues, Daphne Economo and Marcus Menzelopoulos. And we are gonna talk about technical considerations for designing and implementing immersive learning applications. So before we go, and, and we delve into the topic. Um, I'd like to for, for all of us to do a quick introduction, please. So Daphne, you first. Hi, I'm Daphne Economo. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in computer science at Westminster University. I've been leading the serious games at Westminster Group uh, that it was, it was established in 2015 uh, at the university. Um, uh, supporting uh, the LLN uh, wet work, uh, network since uh, 2015, the second conference that they ran in uh, Prague. Uh, and uh, my um, uh, area of expertise uh, is on serious games, human computer interaction, and collaborative virtual environments. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's my side. Thank you, Daphne. Uh, Marcus? Hello everyone. Uh, so my name is Marcos Menzelopoulos. Uh, I'm a course leader for the BSc Computer Games Development at the University of Westminster. Um, I'm also uh, engaged with the ILRN since 2015 from Prague. I'm the director for the student activities as well. So we're going to be running as well our ILRN Fuser. More information uh, to come soon on that. And um, Yes, my background is, uh, except not only for games, but also I'm doing machine learning and artificial intelligence. Fantastic. Thank you, Marcus. I'll do a quick one as well. I'm Anasol Peña Rios. I'm a distinguished engineer and research manager at British Telecom in the UK. Uh, I'm also part of the organizing committee, so I'm the general chair for this year's conference. I hope you are all enjoying it very much. And I'm also part of the board of directors looking at publications. My uh, research is focused on AI, immersive technologies, and digital twins. So with that, let's um, let's start. So there you go. I'll pass it to Daphne, probably, because she's our yeah. leader. <laughs> so, uh, we've been uh, all working for a number of years developing uh, various applications for uh, educational purposes, primarily for educational purposes, uh, diff looking at different audiences. Uh, so in our side at the University of Westminster, we developed applications mainly looking at uh, higher education students, uh, but also uh, looking at other areas like uh, in a cultural, cultural context, uh, audiences, uh, you know, uh, targeting uh, primary uh, school, uh, uh, children or you know different ranges and ages and overall what we've uh, and and I and I suppose I mean Anna Sol uh, she's been working on uh, developing immersive applications looking at um, engineers uh, training uh, tra training professionals so between uh, the three of us in here we have experience in developing immersive learning applications in a range of um, environments and uh, for different uh, target users and for different purposes. So they all need to learn something, but it might be um, sort of, um, you know, learning in different contexts and for diff different purposes. Generally, we have been uh, experiencing an increase in the market of immersive learning application. It's becoming a, a big industry on its, on its own. Um, and that happened as, a, uh, as, as, as an effect uh, on the big demand for more interactive and innovative learning experiences from educational institutions, from students, which in, increased the adaptation of the immersive technologies, uh, particularly the last um, sort of decade that the technology started being uh, powerful enough, uh, you know, with uh, offering the required processing power and uh, uh, to, to afford the, um, uh, the uh, resource intense uh, uh, intensive uh, um, needs of this technology. Uh, however, apart from uh, dealing with the uh, sort of a technical, uh, technical um, issues, when you're designing and implementing this type of applications, there are various issues that they need to, to be considered and there are se several technical implications to be considered. Um, 
Anason, if you want to move. Uh, so the immersive learning applications, uh, the, 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 the issues that they need to be considered, we figured out that we can categorize them in, in four broad uh, areas. Uh, issues that they have to do with the pedagogical requirements. We have to think what are the needs, what are the learning objectives, what is the scope of the application, uh, at what stage of, uh, you know, of learning they support. Is it to prepare students to learn? Is it to assess students at what stage of the learning process? Uh, you know, we're, de we're developing something for. Um, what are the user experience implications? Um, we people are talking about uh, uh, engagement, increasing engagement. Uh, we are thinking about uh, uh, gamification and you know doing various tricks in order to increase. Uh, immersion, not increase immersion, but increase engagement. Uh, we have to think of the hardware that we're using, and the hardware has got uh, a very important role into considering, you know, what decisions we're going to take, what design decisions we're going to take, um, but also what development decisions we will have to take. And also, we have to consider other technologies, other technologies that are not necessarily the hardware that we're using, the headsets or the controllers to interact uh, with the applications but also other technologies, for example, analytics, AI, to understand user behavior or to understand learning behavior or to understand learning and understanding. Um, so these are the technologies, these are the, sorry, the main criteria that we thought that uh, they play important role into, um, that they need to be considered be, before we start working on developing an application. So what we thought of doing in this workshop is to go and uh, uh, talk to you about various use cases. Um, and also if you can move into the next uh, slide, please. <clears throat> so we collated uh, five different use cases based on applications that we've been um, working to, to develop, apart from the last one, which is um, my understanding is that none of us has really done something with that yet, um, at least with the way that uh, people refer to Metaverse at the moment. Um, so for this, we, we will make uh, just a, a general discussion about uh, web VR and Metaverse in the educational context, uh, context at this stage. So, uh, so far we um, collated uh, some uh, different use cases uh, looking at VR uh, because when we're talking also about uh, immersive technologies, uh, it's different technologies on its own. We're, we're talking about VR, we're talking about uh, AR, augmented reality, about mixed reality when other sensors are um, uh, integrated in the application, 360 video, which is a different case on its own, and web VR. Uh, so regarding VR, we're going to explain uh, the implications uh, developing um, a scenario related to criminology. Regarding AR, we're going to present you a use case related to from borrowed from BT related to real life augmented reality uh, assistant assistance. Uh, in mixed reality, um, we're going to discuss a scenario related to uh, helping and supporting people learn sign language as a foreign language. In terms of 360 video, we picked up one of the scenarios, one of the use cases we work with in again at Anasol in BT work uh, for uh, BT tunnel uh, tunnel attractions. And as I said, uh, for web VR, we will make a general discussion of how we understand metaverse works at this stage um, and what are the implications. So, uh, Anna, so if you can move into the, so I'll pass it now into Marcos, who's okay. going to talk about uh, the first use case. Yeah, definitely, just Tony, before we continue, just to mention that uh, after we are doing all the <laughs> scenarios, we are going to be having uh, the breakdown of the rooms. Do you want to go on that as well? So people, they know how the workshop will run overall. Yeah, so uh, we will start by, by presenting these cases and, and explaining how these four different uh, criteria that we identified uh, affect, uh, have an effect on uh, the uh, design considerations and the technical considerations. And then uh, we will give you two uh, new use cases and we will move into another collaborative tool, Mural. And, uh, you know, we can work around these two use cases, having, uh, and we hope that having the discussion based on the use cases that we will present to you, uh, we will start thinking of 
the implications based on these four criteria. Uh, now, our aim is to start understanding, because one of the main problems that we found that um, we all experience is that there isn't a centralized place where all this information can be found. So, you know, we, uh, we um, individual uh, sort of research groups, we have knowledge on developing various applications, but there isn't a centralized place to go and share all this knowledge. So if somebody goes to develop a new application, a new scenario, um, you know, what are the things that they need to be considered? And what are the um, sort of a kind of a linking to resources that they are available to help somebody make a start? So we hope to start after the um, end of this conference this year, to start working um, together and work with whoever is interested to, uh, in this um, endeavor uh, to start developing a knowledge base, bringing all this application, bringing all this knowledge um, and creating a okay. ILRN, uh, making ILRN as a sort of a hub of knowledge uh, where people, you know, can have, uh, can, can, you know, can come and make a start uh, with uh, developing immersive learning applications. So, you know, I'm passing it back to Marcos to talk okay. about the first use case, which is related to VR technology uh, uh, on a scenario related to criminology. All right. Thank you very much, Daphne. Uh, so, uh, just to clarify as well that this was uh, part of a paper we presented as well on previous uh, island conferences. So, we are bringing knowledge that already has been discussed separately uh, from each one of us as part of the ILRN series. Uh, so University of Westminster, we created a virtual simulation uh, using uh, VR technologies as well uh, to support um, our law school. Uh, it's a kind of a adaptive system. It's not to replace, of course, the teaching. It's just as a supplementary material to engage further the students instead of using the casual uh, breakdown books, reading, uh, law concepts and applying them based on the knowledge we wanted to give them more an immersive experience and they uh, bring them forward uh, let's say to te the technology um, it was one of the most difficult situations because uh, we have seen that the majority of the students first of all they are not 100 percent gamers okay which means they, they they don't know easily how to handle keyboard mouse other devices of course uh, they understand mobiles okay uh, they don't follow up easily the instructions as you are expecting people they are engaging a bit engaged to see the environment so user experience is quite important and how to follow up and also the most important part is the uh, is the design accessibility which means it is has to be device uh, dependent and uh, how these students they will be able to use it because we're talking about large cohorts of uh, students they will need to do work on it uh, in real time on a specific time domain so it's not about licensing only there are quite a lot of um, implications behind it which potentially can affect uh, other designs uh, for everyone who is thinking creating similar um, projects so um, the project overall is supposed to support visualization and contextualization behind um, uh, criminology, uh, criminology and understanding uh, the engagement when a person uh, under, uh, visits an environment where a crime scene has happened, uh, how to uh, interact with objects, with people, it could be friends and family, it could be police officers, it could be uh, you need to go then to the, the medical investigator, uh, understand crime reports, um, the way you're going to be seeing sometimes video images of the victim, the brutalization sy sy symptoms inside, and take all this information, write report, and based on that, you make some judgmental situation. Um, so we tried, uh, the original development was done in Unity, and uh, we, we started uh, creating the initial uh, sketch, which you can see on the bottom two screens uh, where we try we added um, elements for the user where they can um, uh, easily navigate uh, as part of the map between the scenes. Uh, there is uh, a notebook where um, it is embedded within the system 
for a student to be able to write with a mouse or keyboard elements they are discovering instead of sometimes they might not be having notebook next to them in order to write all these documentations. But this can be done in real time and safe as well uh, on the backend system so they can retrieve it later on on their own uh, time. Uh, it has, of course, um, elements of um, game-based learning. Uh, so all this interactivity, uh, all the uh, hit, hit marks uh, we are giving them to navigate them, to, to push them a bit on the scenario. Otherwise, they might move out or outside of the scope. Uh, it's a method of authentic assessment. So it um, supports this kind of new uh, experience. Uh, the, ma the majority of the, uh, of the uh, universities they are trying to embed it now. Uh, so this is as part of the pedagogical requirements. Uh, Anna Sol, we move to the next slide. Um, as part of hardware now, um, we started using uh, the stage one was supporting just desktop application. Uh, and we tried as a second stage as well the VR. Uh, they were uh, to see a bit the differences and how easily the students can uh, uh, apply the knowledge behind it. Um, there was a big of a problem, I have to say, because first of all, VR, it was not easily accessible from everyone. And it was uh, time uh, problems uh, when students, they would need to book spaces to use uh, our labs in order to integrate it while things for this scenario, maybe it's a thing you, everyone needs to consider is the accessibility and how many people they will be using it. So uh, the new version, for example, has a web VR browser opportunity. So people can, from their home, actually use it as well. And uh, also we moved uh, to the um, Unreal Engine, uh, which is actually the bigger image where you can see, which provides more quality data and also integrates qualitative data at the background uh, and statistics analytics where academics, the uh, users can work on it. Um, regarding UX, uh, we, we try to incorporate a lot of gamification elements. That's part of engagement and also the uh, supports the analytics for the academics that they are running this workshop class. Uh, to support uh, understand how students they are understanding the scenario and where they are engaging, where they are disengaging. Important part as plagiarism as well, because as academics, we need always to consider this. It has authentic uh, um, registration and uh, two ways of authentication as well, to make sure that uh, there is no copy paste of profiles between the students. Um, as part of UX as well, we are looking for interaction with the environment, understanding hints, clues. Uh, as you can see, the map as well, uh, all of these features, they are hidden most of the time across the screen. So they are not, they are embedded, as we said, within the environment. So they don't obstruct with the overall perspective and the student can be able to move across and look and feel really how the environment is. And uh, also you can see real videos, images of the victims, if you want, okay, which gives you actually messages. Do you want to see these details? Because sometimes may be a bit um, of uh, ethical considerations, the way you're going to see brutality behind it and write your comments, or do you want to see a more cartoonist, let's say, version to avoid any implications? Uh, considering now other technologies, and this is where the next version uh, we will be moving on, is uh, to include uh, the new technology behind Unreal. That's why we chose it, which is the MetaHuman. And that brings uh, a new era, really, behind the interview sessions that will be happening, because uh, it is giving the full depth of having visualized features of the face person you are looking on it but also creates a lot of diversity on the actors and their behaviors. Uh, twin motion as well, because it gives more background environment as part of the user experience. And one of the new designs we are investigating now is the Convey. It's the conversational artificial intelligence, which is like ChatGPT, but integrated SDK for Unity and Unreal. And provides, if you put uh, visual effects and uh, 
avatars, it creates mimically a whole dialogue based system more casual than anything really on your scenario. You can put even a whole book and recreates the whole um, behavioral modeling of your avatars while you are conversationing with the actual user and provides feedback um, well, as part of immersion is really to the scenario. Um, that's it for me, really. I don't think so. I have any other slides in mind. No. Nope. All right. Next, next one is me. Thank you, Marcus. Okay. So uh, the next use case is focused on augmented reality. So as you know, augmented reality has different uh, affordances. And the scenario specific is more towards um, uh, training. So this is more um, yeah, related to in this industry. So before I go into the um, application itself, I just wanted to give a very quick background of of the company so you understand why we have these specific requirements uh, in terms of hardware and user experience. So this is for field force engineers. So British Telecom is a UK's leading network provider of anything telecoms. So it can be fixed line, broadband, mobile services, um, TV, IT services. And it has operations around the world, but the key issues here are that uh, the network underpins the UK's critical national infrastructure. That's why we always need to have someone ready to fix anything that is wrong. Apart from doing uh, consumer services, we also support the, the critical national infrastructure. And we employ approximately 7,000 uh, um, engineers that work on different areas in different capacities. But as you see, it's a very large workforce. And the idea is we need to have them the knowledge ready for them to consume it in a way that they can apply it easily. So we were then designing an application uh, using augmented reality to help them uh, doing installation. In this case, it's installation of, of fiber um, uh, to houses, so to bring a broadband into houses. Um, but the business objectives, these are key when you are talking about industrial applications because everything you do needs to give uh, value back to the business. That's why I have these um, points here about business objectives. So business objectives of the application, um, apart from training and giving support, our engineers are more related to uh, the bigger picture for the company. So speed up uh, the rollout of infrastructure or um, reducing the errors when the engineers do these um, these tasks. That's why it's very important that we have the right information at the right time for the right user. This will allow us as a company to reduce um, job completion times and uh, also avoiding sending people over and over to uh, fix the same issue, uh, which uh, also uh, it, it is related to quality of service. So the challenges we have in developing immersive applications for this specific area is that we have, as I mentioned, we have a very large workforce, but it's also an aging workforce. So this involves um, topics of accessibility. So how, how easy it is for people to look at the technology that we are using and as well, how easily they will adopt the selected technology. So this is key for us before identifying what are we using for the purpose here. Um, other things like, uh, how we can quickly onboard new employees. Uh, the way that uh, uh, um, technicians and engineers um, get trained is when they join, they are apprentices, unless they have experience. But when they join, they are, they are apprentices and they are in a two-year uh, program of training. This, um, this is part uh, theoretical knowledge, so they have to attend some um, courses. But they also, and mostly, they do on the job training. So they need to shadow uh, experts in the field and then uh, learn from what they are doing. Because a lot of these things are very practical things that is difficult to replicate in books or slides. So that's why we have a very focused learning by doing interaction that needs to be um, integrated in this type of applications. So um, here, what we designed was an uh, augmented reality application to provide information when you point out to the device, it shows you all the different parts of the device. 
And that's stage one, to get you familiar with uh, the equipment itself. The second stage is to validate the work that has been done. And this can be used in two different ways. One, in training. So whilst you are learning how to do it, you can point out to the, um, with the phone to the equipment and it will tell you what is wrong. And then the other way is to do assessment at the end, which is auditing of a, of a task to look at if the installation was done correctly or we need to do something else before we leave premises to avoid, um, yeah, to avoid do rework uh, later on. So for this type of requirements, we had then to focus on non-immersive VR because while well, having, first of all, having headsets, it's not safe to be on, on field and also it's expensive because of the, no, the large number of engineers that we have. So, um, and as I said, we also need to consider technology adoption uh, given the, the aging workforce um, challenge. So we focus on mobile applications and this is standalone uh, devices like uh, the mobile phones. Uh, this also uh, was linked then to very specific technology requirements, which are uh, low cost devices. So handheld devices, as I said, even though it's not ideal, it will be easier to have headset for people to work with their hands in whatever they are doing at the moment that is not possible. So we had that constraint. Um, and we also uh, were looking at giving real personalized feedback, but I will go into that um, in, next, in my next slides. So we designed this uh, application and we have gone through a number of iterations for the creation of this application. One of the challenges when you do mobile uh, applications, of course, is small screens. So how you can put a very large amount of information without this being overwhelming or confusing for the users. Uh, this needs to be designed in different layers. So you can only show the information that is needed for the activity you are doing at that time rather than putting all together. Um, given this amount of information, we had some feedback that the equipment that we were pointing out, sometimes it was difficult to actually see. You had lots of text and buttons in the screen. So that, that was constraining the visibility of the real world, which is something that it needs to be considered. And as well, the, the buttons and the interactions need to be designed not to obstruct the screen, but also to allow engineers, which sometimes they are wearing uh, gloves or they, um, yeah, they, they, they need to deal with other stuff at the same time that they are holding the phone. So it needs to be, the buttons needs to be uh, accessible and easy to use the whole application. So it needs to have really clear instructions of uh, what they need to do. In terms of incorporating other technologies, well, we were looking at, or we are working on collaborative intelligence. This is human machine collaboration in which we are, um, intelligence in a way that it can support the human activities to achieve a, a particular goal. So we, when I was talking about validation of the job, we have been looking at expert systems and analytics, but mainly we have been looking at machine learning and computer vision to analyze the status of the, of the installation at the end and then validate that uh, installation using, using this. Um, adding these other type of technologies give us a number of constraints as well. So are we doing on-device machine learning? This means that we need to have higher end devices. Um, if we, if otherwise uh, we can do online um, validation. So connecting uh, to a server remotely to do the validation of the machine learning model. But then this, you need to have internet connection all the time, which sometimes is not possible. Um, so these are th the type of constraints we were looking at uh, for this type of application. And I think that's it from this one. So I'll pass it to Daphne. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, started working on a project, um, uh, thinking of developing uh, an application to help people learn sign language as a foreign language. Uh, there is a demand, there is a great demand uh, for people learning sign language. In, uh, statistic, in statistical analysis that they did at universities in the States, they found that sign language is among the five most popular languages, as foreign languages, uh, in uh, universities. So people, we're not targeting here into deaf community, deaf people that they want to learn sign language. We're targeting anybody who wants to learn 
sign language as a foreign language in order to be able to communicate with the deaf community. Uh, uh, Anna, sorry, if you can go to the next slide. So this is a project that is started as a, a final year project. One of my students started working on this uh, co concept uh, a few years ago, and then this student uh, happily graduated and moved on uh, with um, other things in in her life, using on uh, working on user experience. But other students picked it up and developed the idea uh, a bit further. Uh, and now we are proposing a system that um, uh, it uh, the, the the uniqueness of uh, of the system is that to go, the, the combination combining an innovative pedagogical uh, method, which is the scaffolded instruction uh, with gamification uh, theory and advanced technology, combining digital video, virtual reality, image processing, speech recognition, data analytics, and VR and I uh, are tracking. I'll talk about it uh, as I explain how this um, application is constructed to effectively support people to learn sign language. So in the terms, in terms of pedagogical requirements, this application uh, helps the people uh, in uh, three stages. It helps them to, first of all, uh, get familiar and learn the uh, signs. And this is happening, um, I, I presented here as a level, so that it's split into th three levels. The first level is they explore a virtual environment, they collect uh, um, signs, they collect uh, um, signs in, in, uh, scattered in, uh, in a terrain. And when they're collecting a sign, this triggers a video that it plays to show how the sign is formed. Uh, now they do this um, working in three different uh, environments that uh, they differ in terms of complexity of design. So the first environment is, is quite busy with, um, uh, with objects within the environment to make it interesting for users. Uh, in some user testing that we did, uh, we found out that some people got co confused with the complexity of the environment. So we created a second environment. So one set of letter letters, they learn it in an environment which is quite busy visually. Uh, the second set of letters, they learn it into an environment which is decluttered from um, complexity. And in the third environment, they do it, uh, they also have mnemonics. So the mnemonics are objects that they are. Uh, somehow help the students to memorize the uh, uh, the letter that they are trying to find. So, for example, banana for B. So this is the first level. The first level, they collect all the signs. They see the videos. The, the videos they can uh, they they see them by default three times, but they uh, and they collect them in in a in a. Uh, in a in a book again uh, in an inventory. And they can play them again and again if they think that they can't remember it and they want to help their memory. And once they complete this level, they move to the next level where they practice with the science. So in that environment, the system uh, pops a letter and the users, they have to sign the letter. Uh, so for that one, we are using uh, uh, image processing and hand recognition. In the first level, uh, I'll talk. Uh, the, the the requirements for the users is to be able to see their hands, see how they're forming the signs. In the second, but uh, in the second environment, this is a necessity. So the system needs to understand how the systems form the sign um, in order to give them feedback if they formed it correctly or not. And after they've practiced and they feel confident enough in the second level, they move to the the final level, and the final level is the assessment. Uh, and the assessment happens again in a gamified way where there's a master running to catch the, the players. The masters, they've got a sign uh, above their head and the users, they have to speak the sign that they think that the master uh, carries above their head to keep them away. Um, so this is the, the scaffolded instruction and the gamification that I mentioned in uh, one of the uh, innovations of this application. That's how the users Gradually, they uh, you know they they learn something. We help them to practice it, and then they are assessed. This is the scaffolded instruction, and the gamification is of course that all this is uh, in a in an environment that uh, uh, it has game elements. If you can move to the next slide, Anasol. So this environment we built it as non-immersive and uh, an immersive. Non-immersive meaning 
uh, not wearing headsets. <clears throat> so the non-immersive environment runs from standalone uh, devices and via a web VR browser. Uh, and uh, it could run via a mobile uh, device, depending that the mobile device is powerful enough to uh, do all the processing, uh, browsing it from the web browser. Uh, and uh, for the immersive uh, VR, we've experimented with two different uh, headsets. Uh, one was the Oculus 2 uh, MetaQuest and uh, an HTC Vive. Um, and the reason for doing this is because uh, HTC Vive uh, enabled us to uh, work with some um, uh, analytics that we want to uh, uh, integrate in there in order to gather user behavior. If you can uh, move to the next uh, slide, uh, Anasol. So now in terms of user experience, uh, what are the things that and the technologies that they are involved in here is that we're having in the first environment, we're using um, eye tracking in an immersive environment. In the non-immersive environment, we're not using eye tracking. Uh, actually, sorry, in, uh, yes, we're using eye tracking um, in order to, uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, to uh, analyze user behavior, to see exactly where the users are looking uh, and what is uh, what elements attract their uh, interest. And we're using it uh, also in the immersive environment for a casting to assist users to be able to navigate in the virtual environment. Uh, in terms of... Uh, gesture recognition in uh, the non-immersive environment. Uh, this is not a request in the first level because this, the users, they can see their hands uh, forming the signs. In the immersive environment though, when they are wearing a headset, um, this is an issue because we have to, we need to find a way of uh, being able to um, do, uh, to sign uh, the, um, the, the, the signs for the, the signs and also being able to see the hands in the virtual environment, which is something that, you know, if we are using a headset, you, you can't see your hands. So we need to find a ways of integrating that in the virtual environment. In the second uh, environment, uh, it, hand recognition is um, uh, uh, very important uh, because based on uh, hand recognition, we're using machine learning to train the system uh, to understand the correct formation of the signs. And then we're using image processing in order to um, uh, understand the correct uh, formation of the sign uh, to be able to give uh, feedback to the users uh, if uh, they are forming the sign correctly or not. Um, and um, if they're not forming it correctly, then the system keeps uh, uh, giving them uh, the, um, the sign again and again until, and, and then it tracks if they've uh, uh, detected the sign correctly three, three times, and if they don't, then it shows them a video again to uh, help them learn. So uh, here, uh, the uh, image processing and uh, uh, hand recognition is, is important in order to uh, give um, feedback to uh, uh, for the players to progress. And uh, the final level is the um, speech recognition, which uh, um, again, if we're using uh, a, a non-immersive environment or a non or an immersive environment, it can be um, uh, it can have diff different implications. Now, the other technology that we're using is analytics, and we're using analytics in order to uh, understand um, learning behavior and also user behavior. Learning behavior to, uh, that helps us to understand how many um, times they've done something wrong, uh, what is the order that they uh, collected uh, the signs, and uh, how this affected the learning, how many errors, and um, the uh, um, uh, the uh, user behavior in terms of how they navigate and uh, uh, perhaps how this affects their experience. We can move to the next slide. Yeah, and that's from me uh, regarding that scenario. Okay, thank you, Daphne. I'll explain now the next one, which is about 360 video. Uh, this is actually a kind of an old um, application we did in 2020. So, and this was actually presented as well in iLearn 2020. So, the business objectives again, coming back to um, more industry oriented applications, um, we need to tie all of these with business objectives. So, the objectives for this one was to showcase uh, working scenarios for specific engineering roles. We were, we are trying to attract 
uh, people to join those specific roles and sometimes it's it's difficult to to find people for for those so uh, we were targeting um graduates and apprentices for for this and the idea was to create an application that could share what it is to be an engineer kind of a day in the life of uh, during um, some of the um, uh, talent attraction uh, events that that we have uh, the other purpose of this application was to create virtual tours to uh, to tour uh, facilities uh, of, of the premises but the idea was mainly to uh, also train people or not train but show people what exactly we do and also make familiar some of the engineers when they join to the premises um, because some, some of these premises they don't go immediately when they join so they also join they, they also see this uh, they only see this after um, they have completed some of the uh, training so uh, challenges well um, the, when you decide when, when we were designing this application we had we had to design for a limited time of um, um, usage for I mean uh, what I mean is the user only is there for a for a few minutes it's not an application that in this in which this person will have a lot of time um, usually they are because the interaction with 360 uh, images is limited to just visiting and looking at the information there this also has a challenge of how to create engaging activities so how to add things like gamification and interaction into these type of applications and uh, yeah the challenge as well was how we can portray the the information or the feeling of being there in these type of facilities uh, which are in re engineering related areas in the company uh, which as I said only employees have access to and when they have reached certain level of training uh, because of health and safety um, policies and because of hazards and, and things like that so it, this is not open to everyone so these were some of the challenges when thinking about how we can um, yeah design this application in terms of hardware we were thinking about okay um, needs to be something that can be easily accessible. So we are thinking about again non-immersive VR and uh, particularly standalone devices. So how we can design for this. Um, in terms of user experience, as mentioned, one of the challenges when using 360 uh, um, videos or images is that interaction depends on the application itself rather than the the content. Sometimes, so we need to. Um, take into consideration simple navigation. And for that, we integrated three control modes, which is which are swipe, um, gyroscope, and stereoscopic VR, in case we had one of the cardboard headsets at, at hand. And based on that, what we did is we added hotspots in all the images based on three different categories. So one was information about the, the equipment or the area that you're visiting. The other one was about a, a comment from a colleague that works in that area. And then the final one was uh, the teleporting uh, hotspot. So you can navigate between different areas and, and do kind of a virtual visit. Um, another challenge in terms of user experience and maybe not user experience, but it, it is about how we can um, create content in a way that it's dynamical, dynamically configurable. So one one big challenge is okay we create an application but how easy is it to add more content or how we can actually update it for different purposes so if we need to add more um i don't know a different um, training different visit well how we can do this in, in an easy way so these hotspots were created dynamically based on spherical coordinates and this the idea was that anyone with access to the admin part of the application could configure easily this uh, just based on a on, um, couple of coordinates there and also to load different types of uh, 360 images whilst they are doing that. Um, in terms of other technologies, well, we were trying to measure engagement. And again, this is something that it's, it's difficult when you have limited choices uh, in this type of application. So what we did is we uh, created an AI-based 
engagement um, sort of agent. It was using um, type one for Silogic to look at how much, how, how many of the uh, hotspots were uh, visit uh, compared with how much time you spent in the application and in this in these particular um, spaces. Um, so this was also in this also involved some sort of analytics to measure um, how much time people were using the application and which kind of areas they were particularly visiting within the content available at that time. And all of this was compared uh, against reported engagement, uh, which we gathered through questionnaires. Uh, and yeah, just I just want to. Um, explain a bit more about this because again one of the challenges is you, you need to define the interaction and the pedagogical requirements and in my case also all of this is linked to business requirements uh, in base uh, to select the right technology that you will use for the application and with that I think I'll pass it to is it Marcos? No, it's back to me, uh, Anna. So okay. it's about okay. web VR and uh, metaverse. Uh, so, and if you can move into the next slide. <clears throat> so, in terms of uh, web VR and metaverse, uh, we don't have a specific uh, sort of use case that we build to uh, to discuss. Uh, but in in a way, applications like Virbella that we are uh, you know we're using, they they capture. Uh, elements uh, that um, you know we can think and consider uh, to discuss related to the uh, four points uh, and the four criteria. For for example, in terms of the pedagogical requirements, um, if we are building uh, a web a web VR uh, metaverse, well, we are trying to pick up a web VR metaverse uh, technology uh, to build up an educational um, uh, scenario, a use case. Uh, we need to understand the context uh, for interaction. Uh, we need to see, and we came um, across that in, uh, in, in the past, if there is a possibility to create bespoke environments. Um, uh, we had an experience in the past by uh, trying to support our colleagues in uh, the Department of Politics and International Relations and Law uh, that they wanted to be able to create bespoke scenarios. And be so bespoke meaning bespoke environments environments can be slightly changed in order to support the educational needs of the um of the use case the scenario uh, in order to 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 change the scenarios to be able to update dialogues especially when the uh, users the learners they have to interact with um agents uh that they would respond to a certain set of dialogues in a certain way um uh, enable different uh, modes, uh, for example, a discussion uh, mode or a lecture mode. We have seen uh, metaverse environments like this that they allow um, sort of uh, free sessions where the people, uh, the, the students are able, able uh, available to uh, communicate uh, with, with each other and discuss. And then it's the lecture mode where everybody is seated and they need to uh, pay attention on the uh, uh, presentation that the lecturer decides to, uh, to do. Um, so it's like grabbing everybody and focusing to the activity that they need to uh, focus. Um, screen sharing and uh, camera casting. Um, it's again something that uh, we've seen most of the tools uh, uh, supporting in order to uh, to assist the pedagogical uh, typical pedagogical activities like delivering a lecture or delivering a, uh, delivering a pre presentation, allowing collaboration enabling uh, student control. And when we're talking about ena enabling student control, uh, we talk about individual students and students as groups that they might be engaged in a collaborative activity, they might be um, uh, in engaged in a discussion or, or uh, um, creating and submitting something. Monitor student engagement, that again, it has, it has a variety of uh, ways of monitoring engagement. For example, seeing who is looking at the screens, uh, at the moment, and you know, for what period of time they've been engaged with this, uh, to have they uh, submitted uh, various uh, milestones that they are expected to submit uh, during the um, duration of the educational activity that has been planned for them, uh, allowing uh, the support of breakout groups, uh, allowing uh, the support of social media and uh, users to learners to be able to comment on others' work, 
uh, supporting uh, assessment, for example, um, a session uh, concluding with a, a type of a quiz um, to evaluate the uh, learners' understanding. If you can move to the next slide, um, Anasol. Again, in terms of hardware, we have to uh, uh, consider if we're talking about immersive, uh, if it is non-immersive being uh, not necessarily using he headsets, or if we're using a mobile. And again, if we're using a mobile, if the mobile serves the purpose of uh, an immersive, um, because you know mobiles can be slotted into uh, headsets and uh, <laughs> become themselves, uh, you know, uh, facilitating themselves an immersive uh, sort of experience. If we can move into the next slide. Um, also, in terms of user experience, um, uh, there's a lot of discussion about moving into environments that they offer more accurate representation of objects and the environments. And for certain contexts, this is um, very important. For others, might not necessarily be that important. Again, it depends very much on the pedagogical activity and the context. Um, the uh, shared experience, if how and in what form. Uh, the experience can be shared with others uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, and allow sharing uh, sharing uh, and uh, also uh, security concerns when um, content is uploaded on metaverse when personal data learners uh, uh, profiles and learners learners uh, sort of progress uh, is uh, available in a, 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 a shared environment if you can move to the next uh, slide Arasol and other technologies, like for example, here we're talking about authentication because we're talking about a, a, a collaborative environment that it would require people to log in um, uh, with different permissions and different uh, privileges. Analytics that we can integrate in order to understand learning uh, and also in order to understand task completion um, and, uh, and uh, engagement and user and learner behavior machine learning in order to be able to enhance uh, um, smooth uh, communication with, uh, um, with users and artificial intelligence. So, you know, things that need to be considered um, in order to support all these different uh, aims and objectives of these applications. And that brings it to the conclusion of the use cases that we've discussed so far. If Anasol, you can move to the next slide. So overall, we've seen that there are various implications related to when we're talking about VR, what type of uh, exactly we VR technology we're talking about. Are we talking about uh, virtual immersive or non-immersive environments? Are we talking about augmented reality, meaning um, you know that we uh, uh, merge the real environment with a, a computer-generated environment? Are we talking about mixed reality where we're bringing different sensors into play? Is it 360 video, which is a, again a complete different species on its own because we're mi we're losing the uh, freedom of movement and uh, the, the depth uh, in in VR, uh, or we're talking about web VR and metaverse. Uh, so we would like you to take into this uh, into consideration and let's move. I mean, we so here is a link into Mural. You can click in the chat, and maybe we can. Uh, Move there while can while we one? can you see the scenario? I mean, that yeah. Means... While we stay, yeah. While we stay logged in into uh, into Zoom, uh, yeah. and here we thought of two scenarios. So we thought of two scenarios. Let's say that you are uh, invited to think of designing an application uh, for uh, to support legal education. This is one of the scenarios that we had to face. Uh, some time ago, and support our uh, our, our colleagues in um, the Department of Law uh, to create a scenario for legal education and higher education. So that's the first scenario. And the sec second scenario is um, is to design an immersive learning environment to support bicycle repair training. Now, if you go into morale. And perhaps, Marco, what you can do is you can share morale. Yep. So we can okay. see each other and we can see what you know show? people are doing in there. Does it show? Yes. Yep. Okay. 
Okay, so you see that we have the two scenarios and we have as a reminders of ourselves, the uh, four different categories that we're looking at um, in order to, um, you know, to start thinking of implications, the pedagogical requirements, the hardware that we're gonna use, the user experience, how we expect the users are gonna be interacting with the application and other technologies. And then we have, in Mural gives you sticky notes uh, that uh, we try try to make it color coordinated. So think of uh, thinking of the different scenarios. You can start putting your ideas and your thoughts, and really nothing is wrong here. Of um, of uh, you know what solution you would go for for the two different scenarios. We could split into different groups, but we're not that many people in we here. Are not many people. We can. Work. Yeah, so I think we can we can stay in uh, in uh, in the room, and perhaps what we can do is we can uh, yeah. um, we can consider scenario one first, and we can think excuse, of uh, you know what, excuse what are your me. Problems? Yes. Susan, yes. It's asking for a login. I don't know how some people got in. It asks for a login. I it shouldn't it, because it's I, an open. It's an open toolkit. I mean, yeah. I saw okay. pages there, so he managed to log in and everyone else. So yeah, I know. I'm when I click on the link, it's asking for login. That's... Okay, I'll just watch from here then. Thank you. Okay, that's quite strange. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, well, you can it, you can give us is, uh, the is guide. Is it the same Susan. for everybody? Is it the same for everybody? Because I, I, I he's just it. asking me to create an account, and uh, I create an account, and think I'm there now. So if you can just create accounts, follow a very simple portion. The, yeah, follow the Thank simple you. instruction. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. So Daphne, do you want to lead the discussion for the scenario one? Yes. Uh, yes. For, so let's have a look at the scenario one, designing an immersive application environment to support legal education in higher education. Mm -hmm. um, and think of the pedagogical requirements. What, what do you think? What are your thoughts in here? Oops. What you can do is you can, if you can double click in these, um, Sticky notes, you can write whatever you want in there. So you can write your points. So, yeah. for example, here, one of the pedagogical, yeah. Mm -hmm. Simulate courts. Yeah. Yes. Uh, simulate. So discover the evidence or information about a case, simply courts of law. Nice legal language. Argue against an opponent. I guess that an is opponent, correct. Yeah. With virtual uh, avatar conversation. That's what I understand. Yeah, that's true. Moot? I don't know what is the moot. <laughs> oh, 
well, it's a competition for students uh, that are studying law. So they're, okay. yeah, so they're arguing against each other and there's a decision, mm -hmm. so it's a okay. constitutional issue. Nice. And the national law competition. But it's taking place, as far as I know, in a physical environment. True. True, that could be part of engagement as well. Uh, in form of argumentation, I, you know, students of law argue their cases. Yeah, that does do that thing. So that what Stelios meant with the three D moot competition, arg live argument. My understanding as part of the pedagogical voting. Yes, that's a good thing. It's part of it, absolutely. Sorry, I'm not interacting because uh, I'm moving up and down the, <laughs> the environment as well. In case some people they would like to see more details on the sharing. I wonder where you're picking all this from. <laughs> Sorry? From the uh, sticky notes. If you go in the, pa in the panel on the left, it's sticky notes. So you can pick up a sticky note. Sticky note, you drag it. And you can create in a square, in a circle, however you want. You can draw, you can put icons. I mean, it has a lot of interactivity really of how uh, that's working. I mean, we saw it last year on the ILRN as well, me and Daphne, uh, as part of the IEEE tale. That was Daphne. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, we're about 50 people there. So it was uh, very engaging for all the sectors we split up. And uh, I mean, uh, so yeah, what we hope to do at the end of this uh, session today is to collate all this information and then um, go back uh, back and consider what uh, consider what are the technical implications, you know, how do we go about making decisions? Where do, do we go and find relevant information to start putting all this in, in, in practice? And then um, have a nice, have a discussion with uh, a panel of experts during the on-site conference in um, in uh, California and then see how we take it further uh, in terms of uh, creating a knowledge base for people to you know to support and help people uh, to um, to know how to make a start when they try to design mm -hmm. such an application so we add uh, some uh, hardware considerations now <clears throat> yes. I guess we can move this. So we can I mean, some. people, people can just... go and pick up. Sorry, stay up. Yep. Okay. I said this presentation is highly uh, timely for me because um, I'm supposed to design an intervention to be you know, okay. submitted next week. So I will appreciate if you can put me through or mentor. Thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, you can uh, contact us, uh, David, if you can, uh, uh, we can provide you some emails here on the chat. Uh, okay, so that's my email. And, or Daphne as well, she can put it to you. And, uh, oops, sorry, uh, to everyone. Okay, so uh, maybe you can let us know exactly what what do you want, how you need it. Daphne is the leader of the workshop. Uh, so you can let us know and we are happy to support the way you thank, want. Thank okay. you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so we can go maybe to put some hardware recommendations for it. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, so for example, I would say that, oh, I'm trying to click on um, on it in uh, in Zoom. Uh, Marco, if you want to put the sticky notes on the side of, ah, right, okay, sorry, put, 
Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> So the other one could be as well networking. Yep, something like it could be potentially be exported to mobile or tablet. So it depends really yeah. how yeah. the scenario, who the end users will be in a classroom uh, to provide the highest accessibility. Uh -huh. And it's the stability, maybe not full the immersive like hardware as part of controllers or anything, but still uh, it can be quite uh, engaging on that way. Okay. Uh, okay, I can see people, they start putting uh, UX and uh, we can put other technologies as well. I mean, to synthesize. Well, that's a big one. Yep. I see some nice ideas there.
That's a quite good section. Uh, Daphne, do you want to discuss on the things we have put on, or do you want to do the scenario two, or do you want to just leave it on scenario one? Um, no, I think that I think that uh, I'm, I'm I'm conscious of time, and because you know we're taking we're taking people's time, so uh, would want people to want to uh, continue working on the second scenario, or do you want to work? uh on the oh, first scenario try to um you know to add a little bit more information and close with some discussions looking at the first scenario and this board is open you've got the link so you can continue working on that and adding your ideas uh, and help us to consider certain issues that we can discuss in the panel uh, in uh, california what people want to do Because there are not many people here, so I don't know who is active still. David is. Yeah, I can see David still. Uh, or as well, if people they would like us a specific scenario to be mailed to us, so we can add uh, as part of the discussion. Yeah. So in case that would be very nice, actually. Yeah, if if people can post scenarios to us. Yes, we can consider them. We can add them as part of the uh, platform, and uh, we can take the discussion as well offline. Yeah. Working on this, which means during the main conference in California, yeah. we can present. More where, where, sh where should we suggest this scenario? In the you same can, uh, in the same board. Just put it in the board. Yeah, just click uh, click create one uh, box, a paragraph, and say proposed scenario. Or, you, you know, know a sticky note, a sticky note, a sticky note. Yeah, so we'll pick it up and see. Um, yeah. what just put a sticky note, uh, for example, like yellow one, and put something. Can we consider that scenario? You put maybe on the right hand side of the board, uh, David, and uh, we can follow it up from there. Mm -hmm. Okay, just put it with one of the different colors so it's easier for us to understand that something different to look on it. So yeah, if we if we look at it here, the uh, the the, uh, the ideas that people uh, start putting in there, it's uh, interesting that um, you know the first thing that people put was to simulate court of law, and indeed this is something that it, it's a big requirement actually. I had the moment um, at uh, the International uh, Westminster uh, University in Tashkent, and one of the departments that they have here is law. And they have an actual building, you know, with, with rooms that they simulate a court environment because it is important for the students to be able to sit in a court. Uh, it's a part of the training. That's what they do. So they need to, you know, to, to be dressed, to be positioned. It's, it's a part of the learning. So simulation of the court of law is uh, an important requirement. Uh, also another thing, uh, it's uh, to um, simulate the, the actual language so that the, the people, that the, the lawyers, they need to uh, get into activities that they simulate, uh, uh, they, they get, they help them, they, they help them understand um, and learn the terminology and, and the style of the legal language that they have to use. Uh, people said discover evidence or information about the case. Uh, so I I understand that as getting involved in activities that they will have to explore an environment and discover um, information that can help them in order to make a conclusion. Um, argue against an opponent. Uh, uh, vote. Uh, create create a three D uh, moot court, and actually having people. Uh, to vote for the best defense, 
that brings also a social element uh, and a social, you know, the requirement to uh, collaborate and uh, perhaps being able to, um, to, 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 to see the output of uh, uh, people's activities and vote for this. Uh, four conclusions about this, uh, a case, which is a part of an assessment. So you see that here we're talking about different pedagogical stages. It's a stage that people learn, explore, uh, practice. And then we have uh, the stage where people form conclusions and they are assessed on that. And perhaps best defense is, you know, is voted, which is, you know, it can also be a part of an assessment. Uh, monitor student engagement. Then, uh, in terms of um, in terms of hardware, yeah. Yeah. people suggest here VR integration, web VR to be accessible by any device, um, networking uh, operation, multiple user interaction uh, could be used on a mobile platform, um, tablet platform, following uh, requirements of the user should be responsive across all devices. So again, the, these are uh, impose completely different technical implications because the interaction style is different if you're wearing he headset or, or not, if you are accessing it via a browser or if you are accessing it uh, on a mobile device. And of course, this has a direct effect on the user experience. People, um, in terms of experience, they've got uh, issues here related to navigation. Navigation, I understand it as navigation in the VR environment, but it could be also navigation through content. Uh, it could be navigation through uh, pedagogical stages uh, or through task completion. Um, discover milestones, having an activity as time, uh, time, uh, time restricted that you know, helps perhaps people into focusing and it may uh, have an effect in engagement. Create bespoke simulations without having technical knowledge. Uh, that has been a demand for us from uh, um, educators, people that they are teaching in law, speech-based interaction with realistic virtual agents. Again, that's something that it imposes completely different technical requirements that we need to consider. Integrate MetaHuman uh, for uh, EDI avatar representation, immersive communication and engagement. This is in terms of analytics. In the, sorry, in, in terms of other technologies. Yeah, yes, that, um, yeah. other technologies, yes. Is the meta humans here? So it's the other technology that can be brought in a virtual environment. Uh, and um, Convey AI, Marcos, is this something that you put? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Conversational that's, AI. AI, which Convey. is the platform which creates procedural generation dialogues, but also you put uh, <coughs> of avatars and automatically creates the scenario movement around. So you don't need much really to program. It takes from the text-based information, the avatar, and recreates the model how to move around the space. So uh, we hope that we are going to be able to have a small, uh, some people from the company actually creating that uh, during the conference uh, live uh, as part of the panel there. And maybe they can do a small demo as well, like three, four minutes of what that software provides. Maybe for the future people, the reference, they might like to see it. So, yeah, we, we you know, just to conclude uh, all this, uh, uh, we see that the decisions that we're taking, the, the pedagogical decisions that we're taking, the hardware that we decide to uh, develop an application for, the user experience, um, you know, the interaction style that we decide to use or the experience uh, that we want to create uh, and other technologies that we uh, we want to create are all elements that we need to consider um, that they affect the design decision and they also affect the uh, development, the implementation decisions that we have to take. Marco, is there something that you need to add? No. For people, something that they want to add? Well, thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, stay with us. Uh, yeah. You've got the link. Uh, keep thinking of these uh, issues that we discussed today and keep posting your ideas. 
and we'll hope to collate all this and uh, well, hope we can see, see you in California, either in person or again, uh, because we're going to be streaming this online, uh, uh, pick it up with a panel of experts that we're going to invite in and have uh, an extended discussion on, you know, where we go and what do we need to create in terms of a knowledge base to help people, people take decisions when they're developing uh, immersive applications. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Really happy to have you all.